Good evening, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2003 Godkin Lecture. Uh, the Godkin Lecture is probably one of the most prestigious of the Kennedy School's endowed lectures, established in honor of Edwin Godkin's contribution to political journalism and open debate in the United States. Mr. Godkin was born and educated in Ireland and became the first editor of the nation after he immigrated to the United States in 1856. And the Godkin Lecture Series was established in 1903 to bring speakers to Harvard to discuss issues related to free government and civic responsibility. And past Godkin lectures have included people like Adlai Stevenson, Nelson Rockefeller, Jim Schlesinger, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and William Julius Wilson. Uh, you might ask about this year's Godkin Lecture. And I will answer it by a story that Larry Summers used to tell. Uh, as you may know, Larry Summers worked for Bill Clinton, and he used to quote Bill Clinton as saying, it's always important to be introduced by somebody to you whom you have given a high job or want a high job. <laughs> and you might think that has something to do with why I am introducing Larry Summers as the Godkin lecturer. But it, need not be the answer. Think of the alternative hypotheses before you leap to such a conclusion, such a venal conclusion. One is that we might have decided to choose one of the most brilliant economists of his generation, a man who had won the John Bates Clark Medal uh, and the National Science Foundation Alan T. Waterman Award for Outstanding Scientific Merit. That's an alternative hypothesis. Or we might have decided to choose somebody who had become the youngest professor, one of the youngest professors ever to receive tenure at Harvard at the age of 28, and who had a distinguished career at Harvard uh, before he went away to Washington. And yet another hypothesis is that uh, we decided to pick a former Secretary of the Treasury, a man who left his mark on national and international policy and that uh, would also strike me as a plausible alternative. So before you think that our motives are simply Clintonian in making this decision, <laughs> I invite you to think of those alternative hypotheses and finally to clinch the point to realize that the choice is made by a committee of faculty, not by the dean. With that, let me say that we are indeed to have a for uh, happy to have a former Secretary of the Treasury a, a distinguished economist of his generation, a, uh, a great public servant and scholar, uh, Harvard's 27th president, Larry Summers. Um, Joe, thank you very much for all of that. Uh, there's another thing that Bill Clinton always taught about which was expectations management. <laughs> and in that regard, you have utterly let me, you have utterly uh, let me down. <laughs> Before I say anything else, I, I just want to let people know of something I learned of a little while ago. Uh, Samantha Power of this faculty was awarded the Pulitzer Prize today. Her book sets the standard for us all. I want to be um, very clear at the outset uh, that the views I express tonight are only my own. They do not represent the institutional perspective of Harvard University. They do not represent the past views necessarily of the United States government. And they most assuredly do not represent or cannot be relied on to represent the current uh, views <laughs> of uh, the government of the United States. I also want to be clear about the vantage point uh, from which I speak. Uh, people in different perspectives, uh, different positions, speak from uh, different perspectives. Speaking as a policymaker, one's objective is to speak in reasonable ways, using ambiguity where possible, to build as wide a sense of consensus as possible. That will not be my objective tonight. 
speaking as an academic, one's perspective is often to try to add a new and novel argument to a problem under consideration, even if it is not the most important aspect of that uh, problem, adding value by being novel. That also is not my objective tonight. Rather, my objective is to assert and argue for what I regard as important truths that are often lost track of in debates over uh, economic policy. I shall perhaps be guided by uh, Keynes's celebrated admonition that words represent, words should be a little bit wild, for they represent the assault of thought. An approach of this kind, I think, is uh, something we tried to pursue when we were at the Treasury. It was always our objective to begin by ignoring all considerations of politics or political feasibility and to think about what the underlying forces in a given situation were and what policy would be optimal. And then after having completed that consideration, bring it to bear often with painful results on the critical questions of what was feasible in any given situation and what was the best way to argue for a given conclusion in any particular conclusion. In that spirit, uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to begin by reflecting on America's stake in global development and then concentrate on what I believe we know about economic development, what it is associated with it, and what causes, what policies most directly bring it about. Tomorrow night, in what is the second lecture on this series, I will discuss the critical questions that for many are the essence of the globalization debate involving the flow of capital and involving in particular the role of the IMF. And then on Wednesday, I will reflect on the political aspects, both within developing countries, within industrialized countries like our own, and most crucially, in the interactions between them in global fora. My original idea was to speak tonight about globalization and what would make it better, and to speak only from that perspective. But I remembered um, something that had frustrated me in my years at the World Bank, and that was the repeated tendency of that organization and me while I was in it to use what I came to call the international financial institution imperative tense, as in countries must make education universal. The world must find ways to reduce trade barriers. And there was a certain mushiness in the ambiguity of the antecedent uh, in that proposition. And so it seems better to approach policy questions from the perspective of governments or entities that at least have the capacity, potentially, to make policies. If you think about the challenges that the United States faces over the last 50 years, over the next 50 years, they stand out in many respects. Uh, our unipolarity has been uh, extensively uh, discussed the changes that were brought about in the post-World War, post War II period and now after the Cold War have been extensively uh, discussed. But I would suggest that there's one aspect of our current situation that commands uh, attention and provides my focus tonight. And that is this, that from a security, from a moral, or from an economic perspective, most important determinant of the international success of the United States of America will be almost entirely what happens in the developing world or how the process of globalization plays out. Think about the security aspect. 
American troops have been put in harm's way in the last decade in Iraq, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, Kosovo and again in Iraq over the last decade. All of the major global flashpoints that come to mind, the Korean Peninsula, the Taiwan Straits, Kashmir, the Middle East, lie proximately with the developing world. Russia, once seen as a peer competitor, is today, in least important respects, a developing country benefiting from foreign aid. Those who see a long-run geopolitical challenger on the horizon usually point to China, currently a developing country. What about the moral challenge? American foreign policy has always had an element of morality to it. And surely the moral challenge, and you might put up the first slide, Lant, um, lies uh, in the developing world. Ten and a half million children every year die before the age of five. 800 million people are estimated to go to bed hungry each night. A billion, one and a half billion people in the age of the internet cannot read. Democracy and freedom, too, are moral challenges, but it is very clear that they are far more firmly established in the industrialized and developed world and then in the developing world. And so, too, large parts of the United States' economic challenge lie with the developing world. All of the world's labor force growth over the next, uh, over the next 25 years will take place in the developing world. Developing non-industrialized countries account for a large fraction of U.S. exports. Indeed, they finance a significant part of the U.S. current account deficit. They were the source of much of the financial turmoil that we experienced in the 1990s, something that was dramatically pointed up in the fall of 1998 when the Russian default coming on the heels of problems in Thailand, Indonesia, and South Korea, provoked what President Clinton called the worst financial crisis in 50 years. Whether that statement was hyperbolic or not, there can be little, little question that in terms of international developments, our prosperity, our contribution to human betterment, and our security depends critically on what happens in the developing world. I shall discuss um, the politics of all of this uh, in more detail on uh, Wednesday night. Uh, certainly, our objectives in the developing world have varied through time. For much of the Cold War period, it was uh, co-opting leaders so they would be our allies rather than the allies of the communists. There have been moments when marketing U.S. exports was a paramount uh, objective. There have been moments when concerns of the environment and other kinds have been paramount. But almost any theory of U.S. interests, I would suggest, has the implication that the success of the developing world is enormously in the interest of the United States. Indeed, the success of the developing world and the economic strategies pursued by the developing world and their success uh, are important for yet another uh, reason. And that is that issues of anti-Americanism and issues of anti-globalization have come to be very much associated in the popular mind. And so the question of what economic strategies work in the developing country and the question of what is in the interest of the United States come to be very closely associated. I'd like to argue three basic propositions uh, tonight, each of which I believe should be uncontroversial but all of which are increasingly questioned within the political process, 
and by many citizens. The first, economic growth is overwhelmingly the most important, predictable, and important determinant of development success in all its important dimensions, and especially those which affect individual well-being. Considering economic development apart from growth is like Hamlet apart from the prince. Now, at one level, this is an obvious kind of proposition. Isn't development and growth very similar? But for a set of reasons that are very real, but an economist like me, uh, I confess, finds hard to understand, they have come to be very much separated uh, in the popular mind. This was brought home to me uh, several months ago when one of my 12-year-old daughters came home from school and we had a conversation something like this. Ruthie, what did you learn in social studies? We're learning about the Industrial Revolution, Daddy. What did you learn about the Industrial Revolution? It was a great thing, wasn't it, Ruthie? No, not really, Daddy. Um, what the Industrial Revolution, no, I mean, yes, now we're better off because of the Industrial Revolution, but because of the Industrial Revolution, all the poor people had to come in from the farms to the cities and get their hands cut off working in the factories. There wasn't anything that great about the Industrial Revolution. I said, Ruthie, that can't be right. They can't have taught you that. <laughs> Ruthie has a twin sister, Pammy, who is in a different section in the same school. Pammy came home. What are you learning about in social studies, Pammy? Pammy provided more or less the same story. And I um, then requisitioned their textbook. And <laughs> my daughters had more or less accurately read the textbook. Yeah, you know, the Industrial Re Revolution it was kind of pro and con, you know, pro, the world got rich, con, all these people got exploited. And it was sort of a neutral proposition. And I would suggest to you that propositions of that kind too much shape our impressions of the implications of uh, economic growth. What are its implications? Different ways of looking at the question in terms of average incomes. The matter is obviously a tautology. Think about this. In any major city in East Asia, 30 years ago, there were tens, if not hundreds of thousands of young children working as prostitutes. In the major cities of East Asia today, Seoul, Thailand, uh, Seoul, Taipei, Hong Kong, that phenomenon is no longer present, and it is far less prevalent in Jakarta or Bangkok than it was a generation ago. And there is fundamentally one reason, and that is increases in standard of living that make that activity no longer necessary. What about poverty? A proper and real concern is the number of people in the world who live on under $1 a day and how that has trended uh, through time. There are many questions of measurement that need not detain us uh, here. But if you look at the most careful study that looks at actual purchasing power of people in different countries, rather than converting incomes using exchange rates by Xavier Salamartin, it finds that the fraction of the world population living on less than $1 a day has fallen from 20% in 1970 to 5% in 1998. Further, it finds that all of this improvement is the result of economic growth in the poorest countries. Now, the question will arise, and look at the next slide, well, what about equality and what about inequality? Isn't it the case that if you raise incomes in countries, you may not raise the income of the lowest fifth of uh, the population. And so one needs to think about growth being pro-poor rather than growth uh, being uh, benefiting only those with upper incomes. And indeed, one can see that the correlation between the income of the lowest fifth of the population in a country 
And the average income in that country is not perfect. But as the figure suggests, it is very good. To be sure, the correlation is lower in the next slide. If one looks at changes, there are differences between the growth rate of average incomes and the growth rate of the incomes of the poor across countries. But even here, they are very closely associated. And what one uh, finds, though from work by uh, David Dollar and Art Cray, uh, among others, is that the same things that raise the income of the average, low inflation, reductions in trade barriers, and so forth, that I will discuss in a few minutes, have an equal or slightly greater impact on the growth rates of the income of the poorest people. Growth then is good for people in general. Growth raises the incomes of the poorest people, and it reduces poverty. Some suggest, uh, uh, some suggest uh, however, that what is really most fundamental is not, after all, standards of living, but the basic rudiments of human health. Here, too, the evidence is relatively clear that increases in standard of living are strongly associated with increases in uh, human health. One can predict with remarkable accuracy levels of mortality in countries on the basis of uh, their income. Next slide, Lance. Next slide. Their correlation is, to be sure, not perfect between GDP per capita and under five mortality, but it is remarkably strong. Now, there are all kinds of questions that you could ask, which have been the subject of extensive research. Uh, is the relationship causal? Is it just the countries where things are put together have high incomes and also have health? One can look at the relationship between increases in income and subsequent changes in health. One can look at things that don't proximately affect health, like trade barriers, and examine how they affect um, health, uh, don't, that affect income but don't proximately affect health, and one finds a consistent relation. Indeed, the most careful research suggests that an increase of 1% in incomes reduces child death rates by six-tenths of a percent, and in a similar vein, that an increase in 1% in incomes affects, raises primary school enrollments by half of 1%. So growth makes a profound difference to human development. What about the environment? Here, too, the evidence on local environmental conditions is rather clear. There is no rich country in the world where children breathe lead in the capital city and in almost every poor country in the world, that is what they breathe. If one looks at unsanitary water, one finds a very similar pattern of sharp decreases in access to, uh, un required access to unsanitary water as income levels increase. What about other things that we care about. I already pointed up the key fact on democratic values. There is a large and complex literature linking the seeking to find the causal relationships between changes in economic performance and, demo and democracy or measures of human freedom. What is unarguable is that countries, as they get richer, are far more likely to become democratic. What does all this uh, suggest? It suggests that while growth may not be absolutely necessary for improvements in human development, and there are occasional examples, Cuba may be one, of success on certain human development indicators without growth, and while Growth may not, in every case, be sufficient to produce improvement in human development. The overwhelming 
preponderance of uh, the evidence is that increases in an economy's growth rate are associated with very substantial improvements in almost all the things that we care about in terms of economic development. Now, another way of asking the question is uh, to compare, uh, thinking about some of the human development uh, indicators, what we know about the impact of growth with uh, what we know about other things that we might imagine that we could very directly affect. Pritchett and Fellner have done this most carefully for child mortality. They find along the lines of the graph that's right here that 90% of the variation in countries' child death rates can be explained on the basis of their income. By way of contrast, far less than 1% can be explained by differences in their level of health spending. That does not mean that health spending doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that it's not terribly important to rationalize levels of health spending. But it suggests that what we accomplish in terms of overall economic performance will have a dominant effect on individuals' well-being. Uh, individuals well now, this is not an entirely common or a comfortable view. There is an enormous desire to seek consensus by adapting multifaceted approaches that emphasize everything. The simple fact of experience is that success and growth are enormously associated. There is also a view which I have to uh, I have to say I find myself acutely uncomfortable with. The growth um, is a mixed virtue as, it, as local cultures are overwhelmed or as people flock from idyllic rural lives to teeming slums in developing cities. I have to say that when these views are espoused by espresso-sipping Westerners, I find the implied denial of the revealed preferences of very poor people who choose to move to those cities and who choose to buy the products that we all buy a little bit offensive. Growth then is of overriding importance. What do we know about its uh, determinants? Here too there is a uh, large literature and the matter continues to be uh, hotly debated. The world may change and policy approaches which, work, which appear to work best today may no longer be optimal. That has certainly happened in the past. But there's also much that we do know. I would suggest that the rate at which countries grow is substantially determined by three things. Their ability to integrate with the global economy through trade and investment, their capacity to maintain sustainable government finances and sound money, and their ability to put, put in place an institutional environment in which contracts can be enforced and property rights can be established. I would challenge anyone to identify a country that has done all three of these things and has not grown at a substantial rate. And I would challenge anyone to, identi to identify a country that for any significant period has been held back by either excessive trade links with the global economy, overly sound public finances, or property rights and contracts that are excessively enforceable. A word about uh, each of these areas. Central to the task of development is catching up. This means developing capacities that exist elsewhere and do not exist in your own country. It stands to reason that being open is a way to do this, and so too the available evidence supports this conclusion. Next slide. Gains from comparative advantage, economies of scale, 
the spur of competition, the political economy of creative destruction through external tests, all suggest that countries that are more open enjoy more rapid growth than countries that are not. This is something that was especially true during the 1990s. What about sound growth and uh, low inflation? Here, it's important to begin with two fundamental bits of uh, economic logic. Contrary to much that is suggested uh, in the developing world and in our own country, government deficits, borrowing money, is not an alternative to raising taxes or to cutting government spending. It is merely a way of postponing with interest these alternatives. Similarly, inflationary finance, the printing of money, is not a way of avoiding taxation. It is a way of putting, collecting taxes in a way that is particularly harmful to the poor who hold cash and in a way that is particularly destructive of the economy because it is the fundamental mechanism of exchange, money, that uh, is being taxed. The evidence here, too, suggests, as the next slide indicates, that countries that enjoy low rates of inflation have consistently grown more rapidly than countries that enjoy, high, that suffer high rates of inflation. To be sure, there is room to argue, as industrial countries do, whether 2% inflation is the right target or 4% inflation uh, is the right target. There are examples of countries that have succeeded for some interval with uh, substantial rates of inflation. But it is difficult to argue that either sustained budget deficits or high levels of inflation are other than inimical to economic growth. There's a third element that is, uh, if anything, uh, probably the most important but the most uh, difficult uh, to be rigorous uh, about. And that is the question of the institutional environment and the capacity of countries to establish incentives that support economic growth. I was reminded of the importance, uh, fundamental importance of this. Uh, years ago, uh, on my first trip when I was at the World Bank uh, to a developing country, I, I was accompanied by a guy who had spent a lot of time at uh, the World Bank and was very, very, very experienced. And we went on our visit, and things were chaotic. Appointments got, appointments got canceled. The planes didn't fly. The train didn't run. It was really terrible. And I was quite frustrated after uh, a few days. And he said to me, um, recognizing my frustration, um, Larry, there's something you need to understand. I said, what's that? And he said, if the institutions here worked like they do in the United States, it wouldn't be a developing country. <laughs> and we wouldn't be here on behalf of the World Bank. And it was a very important uh, perspective. A number of uh, studies by Andre Schleifer and his colleagues here, as well as those of many people in the World Bank, demonstrate the enormous variation around the world in the institutional uh, environment. Fundamental things, the ability to collect a bounce check, the ability to evict a tenant who's not paying rent, let alone the ability to close and claim the assets of an insolvent firm are not in place in many parts of the world at great cost. More popular, if less rigorous, demonstrations by Hernando de Soto have been persuasive around the world of the importance of environments that make possible entrepreneurship. As the next slide uh, suggests, this too suggests an important link between uh, property rights and uh, economic growth. Property rights, sound money, openness 
to the rest of the world as keys to the economic growth, uh, keys to economic growth, which is in turn crucial for economic, crucial for human welfare. To many listening, this will all sound um, perhaps reasonable, but certainly like an apologia for the dreaded Washington Consensus. While the term Washington Consensus has been so widely used uh, that it may have lost its meaning, the ideas that I've put forward are indeed uh, central points that the Bretton Woods institutions have put forward in their policy advice and uh, their conditionality in recent years. Why do what seem like clear, even platitudinous observations generate such a probium uh, around the world? What is it about the idea that people in poor countries should, if they wish, be able to buy goods from people in rich ones? Or the idea that countries unable to get their own citizens to hold their debt should try to borrow less that arouses such ire? Much of this has to do with misunderstandings and with politics, topics to which I'll return on another night. But it seems to me there are two main sources of intellectual error that pervade attacks on the so-called Washington Consensus. First, there is the fallacy of generalizing from visible exceptions where governments have successfully done much more than Washington Consensus advocates recommend. To be sure, there are examples of countries that have succeeded for some interval following policy advice that is rather different than the advice uh, that I have offered. And my friend Danny Roderick has listed each one of those examples. But I would draw an analogy to uh, questions of investment performance. Any of us could discover quite a number of people who have gotten very wealthy, who have bought lottery tickets. Any of us could find a number of people who have gotten very wealthy who have failed entirely to diversify their holdings. And so one could take the position that, look, there are plenty of examples of success by investing in lottery tickets, so who really knows? And every investment strategy is equally good, and people need to make their own investment strategy decisions. That, I would suggest, would be a highly fallacious kind of reasoning. Equally, it is fallacious to seek to infer what strategies work and what strategies should be recommended only by looking at successes and not by considering the failures of different strategies. Careful analysis of all of the experiences with purchasing lottery tickets would lead one to the right answer. Careful analysis of all of the experiences with plunging into penny stocks would lead one to the right answer. And any proper analysis of industrial policy needs to consider the Nigerian experience as well as the Korean uh, experience, any proper analysis of the implications of high inflation needs to consider all of those experiences in Latin America during the 1980s, as well as whatever particular example of success in Brazil or Turkey over a few years is being pointed to. And that, of course, is what these comparisons across countries do. They look at the successes and the failures, and the conclusions are relatively clear. There's a second intellectual error that pervades uh, those who seek to resist uh, market-oriented policies, and that is a focus on so-called market failures. There is no question in this world, there's no country in this world, and no area of policy anywhere where there are not market failures that create an a priori case that a properly managed government intervention could make things better. That, for the purposes of policy, 
is a supremely irrelevant observation. The question is not whether policy uh, could be made better. The question is whether public sector policies are, in fact, likely to make things better. This type of issue was posed um, with uh, stark uh, clarity in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall as one contemplated the range of economies in Central Europe and the former Soviet Union. There were some who argued for a more rapid conversion from the previous communist system to a market economy. There were others who argued for the maintenance of a mixed public sector model, who cautioned that it was imperative to delay privatization until a satisfactory framework could be established for governments to regulate privatized firms, perhaps. I would suggest that the lesson of experience, rather, is the governments that cannot organize themselves to regulate firms are even less likely to be able to organize themselves to operate those firms. What was the rationalization for moving to privatization in much of Central Europe and Russia? One story about former Soviet firms makes it very clear. In 1992, it was a common practice for workers in Soviet firms to take the good light bulb out of the socket in the office where they were supposed to be working, bring it home and put it in their lamp and take a bad light bulb from their home that had burnt out and put it to work and, and plug it in at the firm where they were working. And with no owner, with no mechanism of control, there was nothing to stop them from uh, doing that. Any judgment about public intervention must be based not on a judgment about the difficulty of the private sector, but rather a clear and explicit comparative judgment about the role of the public sector and the role of the private sector. And here, uh, the evidence is, um, I would suggest, uh, not uh, terribly, uh, not terribly encouraging. And certainly as Anders Aslan, Stan Fischer, and many others have shown, the experience of the former Soviet Union suggests rather uh, clearly that those entities that reformed more rapidly have significantly higher standards of living 10 years later than those that moved more slowly to implement the kind of reforms that I have described. Let me suggest a third and final proposition here. Countries shape their own destinies. It is certainly true that what happens in the global economy, the rate at which industrial countries grow and demand products, the level of world interest rates, and so forth, has an important impact on the developing world. But if one wants to understand why some countries are more successful, and some countries are less successful, the answer lies overwhelmingly in their own policy choices. Perhaps the best way to point that up is to highlight what is the central difference between the current era of globalization and the era of globalization that we had before the First World War. Think about your image of, the first, of globalization before the First World War. All those financiers sitting in London and making investments throughout the world and clipping coupons from those investments. The flow of capital from the core to the periphery. Think about all those intrepid Europeans setting out for the new world and opportunity, and for new worlds and opportunity. The flow then was very clearly from the core 
to the periphery. What is the flow today? The flow in recent years of capital, of financial capital, as the next slide suggests, is from the developing countries to the advanced uh, economies. Now, it's a bit of an embarrassment for my profession in the international organizations that what little we know about international trade demonstrates is that the sum of the world's current account deficits should be zero. And so if I've divided the world into the advanced economies and the developing uh, countries, by definition, the deficit of the advanced economies should equal the surplus of the developing economies. And it's rather clear that that's not true. And people can argue, and economists do argue, about what the right numbers are and how they can be adjusted to add to zero. For my purpose, there's only one thing that's important. And uh, that is that it's very clear which way private capital is flowing. Indeed, it's been estimated that some 40% of the private capital owned by Africans and owned by citizens of countries in the Middle East is held abroad. What about uh, human capital? It's been estimated that 30% uh, of the college-educated people in Afri uh, Africans work off the African continent. Several hundred thousand uh, college-educated Indians come to the United States and more to the rest of the world each year. The flow of financial capital and the flow of human capital in today's world is from the developing world to the rich countries. What should one make of a fact like that? What's the inference uh, for policy? There is a view that somehow the developing countries should seek to lock that capital in, that restrictions should be imposed to stop uh, capital from uh, flowing out, that restrictions should be imposed to make it more difficult for educated people to move out of countries. Leaving aside the human freedom aspects of those kinds of controls on what people do with themselves and what people do with their money, I would suggest uh, that a strategy of controlling outflows is a little like the idea in the hotel business that maybe you can increase your occupancy if you don't allow anybody to check out. One senses uh, that it is a strategy that will only be effective over a very short uh, run. Rather, the logic of the situation almost compels the conclusion that if one wants to reverse the flow of uh, capital from between developing and industrial countries, it surely cannot be the right strategy to emphasize as the paramount policy response a, concern, a constraint on financial institutions in rich countries' ability to lend money to poor countries. But that's a topic I'll return to tomorrow when I talk about global capital flows. The overall answer must be fairly clear. It must be making it more attractive for citizens to invest their lives and their money in their own countries. And what does that come back to? It comes back to sound money, the ability to buy the products that you want to buy, the ability to have secure property rights, and the ability to enter in to strong contracts. This point is made in yet another way. People have now explored comprehensively the determinants of when aid succeeds and when aid is less effective. To be sure, the level of foreign aid flows is on the order of a fifth of the US current account, of the current account deficit of the industrial countries. 
So even if it all goes in and it is all effective, it is small relative to the amount of money that is coming out of developing countries. It is notorious and obvious that the countries that receive the most aid are the worst performers. Think about the ratio of 10% of GNP or more in aid to GNP in Africa versus a ratio far under 1% for China. But that, of course, uh, proves little. The reason they receive uh, so much aid is that they are performing so poorly. One can, and economists have in a wide variety of ways, sought to control for performance and examine uh, this question. Without belaboring the point, uh, you will not be surprised, given what I've said already, by what those studies find. In certain circumstances, overall, there is very little correlation between aid flows and economic outcomes, very little correlation between aid flows and outcomes in terms of health or education. But, but in those countries that have healthy institutional environments, sound money, where corruption has been brought under control, there marginal dollars make a very large difference in improving rates of economic growth, in improving human development. What then are my conclusions? They are three. Whether we succeed will depend crucially on the rate of economic growth in the developing world. Whether the developing world grows will depend most importantly on the policy choices uh, that it makes in openness, in sound money, and in the ability to contract. And that these choices will be the most important determinant of their success and of the overall flow of global resources. These are not the conclusions one would prefer to reach. It would be much more comfortable to believe that small changes in our policy or politically attractive magic bullets could somehow make an enormous difference in the lives of billions of people in uh, the developing world. But I'd like to suggest to you that as we confront the politics of these issues, as we set our course, we will be best served by recognizing what very strong and available evidence suggests is true. None of this, none of this is an argument against a soft-hearted view of economic development. None of this is an argument against my first proposition in this talk that our success as a nation will depend overwhelmingly on our interaction with the developing world. But it is a plea that precisely because these issues are so very important for our interests and are so very important morally for humanity, that we approach them in a tough-minded and clear-eyed way. And it's in that spirit that I've tried to present this evidence tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. We have uh, time for a few questions. There are microphones on the floor and in the first uh, balconies. And let me please ask you to keep your questions brief and to the point, and one per person. At one point, you talked about that countries shape their own destinies. But as far as access to global capital nowadays, 
it often comes at a cost of their control of the corporations operating within that, whether that's oil in Equatorial Guinea or diamonds with De Beers in South Africa. How do countries maintain their resources for long-term economic growth? You know, if um, it's a fair question, it's a fair question at one level, but at another level, one has to recognize economic reality. Um, Citicorp will loan me a certain amount of money because I'm Larry Summers. It'll loan me, it'll loan me a rather greater amount of money if I tell them that in the event that I don't pay them back, they can have my house. And that's sort of as it should be. And if somebody said that they were going to protect me, they were going to protect me by making a law that said that I couldn't put my house up as collateral when I borrowed money, they probably wouldn't be doing me any favor. And they certainly wouldn't be doing me any favor if I was poor. And so for that uh, reason, um, countries may choose in certain circumstances, uh, not to borrow against uh, certain assets that they have. And there certainly will be situations when that is the right policy for them. But it would hardly be logical or appropriate for us to try to deny people what is potentially an important opportunity, namely to borrow by uh, borrow using as security assets that they have. That's not something that any of us would want done to us, and it's not something we should ever seek to do uh, to developing countries. Yes, uh, I'm Kelly Fujiyoshi, a graduate of the Kennedy School. You talked about uh, foreign aid, and I was wondering what your opinion uh, is of uh, President Bush's proposal to give billions of dollars to fight uh, AIDS in, in the developing world. The question was about uh, the president's ability to, uh, uh, president's proposal to give billions of dollars uh, to fight AIDS. I welcome the initiative. I think it is a very important uh, effort uh, for us uh, to make. Uh, there are people in this room who, who know more clearly uh, the statistics on uh, AIDS. Uh, than I do. I remember this one, though. Um, for every new teacher who is hired in Africa, two die of AIDS. And that points up uh, the profound importance to these societies of addressing AIDS and the profound importance of doing what is even a higher leverage investment, given that the epidemic is at an earlier stage in addressing uh, AIDS uh, in India and China. But, but, and this would be my plea, my hope would be that the administration and the international organizations will be as tough-minded as they possibly can be about making sure that they do not kill people by indulging themselves in spending that money in ways that are attractive sounding, but are less attractive in terms of their actual impact in delivering cures and delivering prevention uh, services. And if one looks in the developing world, what one is struck by again and again is that one finds in the same country efforts to spend tens of thousands of dollars to extend a person's life by one year when there are other opportunities that that country is not choosing to engage in where for an investment of $100 it's possible to, to extend five people's lives by 10 years. And so my hope would be that we will not, as some frankly in the AIDS community have a tendency to do, to put all of the focus on mobilizing as much resources as we can and not put a focus on using those resources in as tough-minded and as an effective a way as we possibly can. President Summers, one uh, in this increasingly 
globalized financial world, one area of uh, debate has been hedge funds. And when you look at hedge funds now and the, the risks that we have uh, in terms of unwinding them if markets go down, particularly as hedge fund investors incur such dramatic levels of leverage, what do you think we should be doing? The SEC is looking at it right now. If you were heading the SEC, what would you recommend? It's a, um, it's a very, com it's a very, uh, it's a very, very complicated, uh, uh, complicated question that I, that I can't uh, really talk knowledge, talk seriously about in the, in the time I've got to answer it. Uh, I would say that the right emphasis should be on any situation where an individual participant or an individual group of participants becomes large relative to an individual, relative to uh, some market. I don't think the activities of hedge funds are fundamentally different from the activities of the proprietary trading desks of many different uh, financial uh, institutions. Indeed, the question of what exactly a hedge fund is uh, is one uh, that is uh, somewhat uh, is one that is uh, somewhat ambiguous. I do think that those who lend uh, to hedge funds are well advised to ask rather more questions uh, than they have historically and than they did at uh, the time of uh, LTC, of uh, LTCM. And so I think transparency. Uh, is uh, something that is uh, important. But you know something, and I'll talk more about this uh, tonight. There's a tendency when you think of financial problems to think of newfangled finance as what is dangerous, hedge funds, derivatives, um, as the really scary stuff. Well, you know, if you look, um, there's well, oh, well into the trillions of dollars in lost wealth because of good old-fashioned banks that were poorly regulated and made bad loans in Japan. The U.S. savings and loan crisis, good old savings and loans, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in losses. The most serious moment uh, in the developing world financial crisis in the last uh, decade the uh, Korean crisis, banks, ba banks made uh, bad uh, loans. There, is, uh, there are enormous problems in financial markets where uh, people uh, get caught in bursts of euphoria and do things that they regret, and then everybody tries to run for the exit at the same time, and they all can't get through the door. But it's a real mistake, I think, to identify those problems uh, centrally with one class of financial actors. So I would rather frame the question in terms of financial stability rather than what we should do with hedge funds. Good evening, President Summers. My name is Emily Whiting, and I'm a second year MPA student here at the Kennedy School. I'm also a member of the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Professional Interest Council, and we're currently hosting City Fair. Um, I'm curious about your opinion uh, with regards to what the role of the federal government should be in helping bail out distressed cities and states with massive uh, state deficits right now. I'm honestly not sure. I'm honestly, uh, I'm honestly not sure. Uh, I think that I would worry about a policy that gave more money to states or cities the bigger the deficit they had right now, because it seems to me that would be rewarding more profligate behavior and be creating of a kind of moral, creating of a kind of moral hazard. I think the interesting question. So I think that is a poor direction. I think that that argument is sometimes used uh, to suggest that any policy would be a mistake. And I think that's very much misguided. It is easy to imagine formulas that don't reward people on the basis of their profligacy that 
compensate states on the basis of their population or compensate states on the basis of uh, their level of income or their long-term historical levels of uh, spending. And I think there is uh, some case right now in the United States on uh, counter-cyclical uh, grounds that uh, the federal government is in a position to diversify uh, these uh, risks. And so I would be quite sympathetic uh, to a time-limited, carefully designed uh, program of assistance uh, to state and local governments and suspect it would rather contribute uh, to improving uh, economic performance. Um, but it's not something I've studied closely. President Summers, I'm a, uh, my name is Khalil Bird, and I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. You talked about growth being good for countries as they develop. Um, I wanted to ask you to sort of break that down into what types of growth you think are more attractive in our globalizing society versus what types are less attractive. You know, in some ways, it is sort of my point, um, frankly, to resist the premise of uh, your question. The fact is that if you look around the world, places that have made their GNP bigger, They've done it in a variety of different ways and in a variety of different circumstances. And almost all of them have seen poor people get to be richer. Almost all of them have seen people get to be more educated. Almost all of them have got get to see people who are uh, healthier. And if you look at people who haven't succeeded in accomplishing economic growth, they've had relatively little successes in those uh, dimensions. So I think the question is less what kind of growth than it is a question of getting overall growth. At the margin, is it better when growth is, takes place in ways that uh, help the poor, uh, when growth is more labor intensive rather than uh, capital intensive? Sure it, is, uh, sure, it is better. But it seems to me that a good deal of progress has been uh, lost because of fixations on getting this kind of growth rather than that kind of growth and targeting the nature of growth rather than recognizing uh, the basic reality that uh, with growth, most things are likely to go right, and without growth, most things are likely to go wrong. This will be the last question. President Summers, if uh, our economic and homeland security here in the, in the industrialized world depends on the decisions that are made uh, far away in the, in the underdeveloped world, what should we do uh, here to influence those decisions? Should we send teams of Harvard-trained economists off to uh, influence right there, or what should we do? Stay tuned. For, <laughs> uh, stay tuned for uh, Tuesday and Wednesday nights. Um, our most important, uh, most important thing we do, really, is um, probably not the experts we send, and it's probably not the conditionality we impose. It's the ideas we develop. And it's the evidence uh, that we marshal. Again and again, uh, and I'll close on this note, again and again when I was in government, I um, traveling, around, traveling to around the world and meeting as somebody in my position did with you know, the assistant finance minister, the deputy finance minister, the head of taxes in whatever country I was visiting. And I jet lag, read my talking points. and. Uh, then uh, he would jet lag. He, he wasn't jet lag. He was just his country. But he would <laughs> he would sort of read his talking point. You know, I'd read my country saying the United States wants you to do this, and uh, he'd read his country saying he'd read his talking points back, explaining why it'd be politically difficult to do what I had just asked him uh, to do. And we'd go back and forth a little bit. And then, when this must have happened two dozen times, he would say some version of, you know, are you the same Larry Summers who used to be at Harvard? And I'd say yes, and he'd say, you know, the year that I was at Harvard as a Mason Fellow, or the year that I was at Harvard at the Center for International Affairs, or the year that I spent at Harvard at the Kennedy, at, uh, the Kennedy School really changed my life. And I must have heard two dozen of uh, those stories, and it says something about us as an institution, but even more, it says something about uh, the power of ideas and the power of experiences. And the most important way in which the United States influences any of this is uh, our example and uh, 
what we do in the ordinary course of our business. That doesn't mean there aren't very important issues, and I'll talk about some of those issues associated with technical assistance, associated with conditionality, particularly in times of crisis. But uh, policymakers are um, a little bit like snakes in a tunnel. And uh, the tunnel, and they wriggle around very fast, but the tunnel is basically determined by a prevailing intellectual climate. And the prevailing intellectual climate is set albeit with 10 or 15 or 20 year lags by places like this one. Thank you very much. Before, before, we, uh, before we let Larry leave, let me remind you that this is the first of three lectures. The second lecture will be tomorrow night uh, in Taubman, and the third lecture is on uh, Wednesday night in Belfer, uh, in any case, this, you've heard one third of the story, not the whole story. It has a wonderful ending, and I invite you to come to all three. In the meantime, help me curry favor with my boss by thanking him for a great start.